Welcome to this fringe meeting on Climate Jobs COP and a just transition for London. It's hosted by the Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group. We felt that, you know, we had to debunk this notion that you can have a good job or a good environment. They're absolutely one and the same thing. Um, and one of our main campaigns has been the Million Climate Jobs campaign, jobs which will actively cut the carbon. My attention was brought to a couple of reports this week. You have the Department for Transport's decarbonisation of transport plan has been published and also the report of the Green Jobs Task Force. I mean, both very worthy, full of nice shiny words that you can say when you're operating the levers of government. Uh, but they're also both typically Tory approaches uh, to their respective issues. I mean, it's right there. I caught my attention uh, in the introduction to the Green Jobs Task Force report. It says um, the potential economic opportunities of the transition to a low carbon economy are becoming clearer. And it says there are domestic and global markets worth billions, which uh, what is that telling you? Uh, but that the, the level of ambition there is limited to putting a coat of green paint on the world that they've created over the last 40 years, effectively. And while I don't doubt that there are people in government genuinely concerned with climate change, it can only be broached from within the confines of that ideology. If you take the transport plan as an example, essentially the approach is to replace carbon emitting vehicles, cars, aeroplanes, with vehicles that don't emit carbon, including cars and planes. Uh, it's a big comprehensive plan, but that's what it adds up to, basically. Uh, like for like replacement, leaving the rest of the world as it is now. And I contrast that with the chapter on transport to appear in the update of the Million Climate Jobs booklet, uh, which gives a much more radical uh, vision. First, it's hopelessly impractical to think you can provide the renewable energy to just carry on doing the things we're doing today. Second, it, it bypasses the enormous opportunity we have to eradicate or at least massively reduce inequality by reconstituting the whole notion of, uh, in this particular example, public transport, so that it's free and cheap, plentiful and accessible to all, as well as green. But beyond those two deficiencies, this kind of like-for-like -like thinking has, has no role for local communities and their specific needs. Uh, I was one of the co-authors of a report, The Green New Deal for Gatwick, which um, was written with exactly those ideas in mind. Employment around the Gatwick area was so dependent on the airport that when COVID decimated flight schedules, thousands of people were thrown out of work. Gatwick Airport Limited touts the fact that it is deeply embedded in the local community as some sort of reassurance when actually it's the opposite, it's a weakness in the economy. The area has to diversify and use the available labour to provide the services people actually need, resolving the problems they can see around them every day. It's this observable because local need that has drawn support from local MPs and councillors for that plan. So our analysis identified over 16,000 jobs in the local area in care, health, education, transport and retrofitting homes to which those workers could be deployed if there was uh, both a will and a plan to do, to, to do that. No, not that there shouldn't be jobs at the airport, because of course there should, but um, the, the dominance of local communities by a single exploitative employer, that is not the model we should be aiming for. Campaigners around other airports are looking to build similar cases based on the needs of their specific communities. And of course, it doesn't just have to be airports. There are nuclear facilities, coal mines, gas drilling, incinerators, tunnel, where the alternatives can be looked at. In the absence of national leadership, which is where we are at the moment, it's establishing these local, green, collectively owned, democratically accountable alternatives and linking them up to form a national and international movement that represents our best hope for the future. And it's that bottom-up change brought by people that we need to be promoting at our conferences and at global events like the COP. What we've tried to do through um, the committees at City Hall, we have an environment committee, but we also have an economy committee. And I chose through the economy committee to um, conduct some research into um, the kind of skills that we need in the future in a low carbon and circular economy. And we came up with a series of what we felt were quite um, sort of business critical recommendations recommendations for the mayor to look at um, and the first one of these was that we felt that there should be a green procurement standard a benchmark for environmentally sustainable procurement practices and that's something that can easily be rolled out across the GLA 
group, which obviously includes um, TfL and MOPAC and so on and so forth. The mayor has already got a good work standard that's got about 200 employers signed up to. Uh, and there's some very good um, employee practices that are contained within the good work standard. And extending it to a green procurement standard would be a really good way of extending that. Um, and, and the mayor responded to the report by saying that his group responsible procurement policy was revised um, in 2018 to include um, some of these more sustainable approaches. Another very practical thing that we wanted the mayor to do was to look at the use of the adult education budget. The adult education budget um, has been devolved to the mayor millions of pounds and it can provide funding for retraining employees with a, with a view to assisting uh, London's transition to a low carbon um, economy for people to transition from one kind of role to the new kind of roles and we wanted some detail on exactly how that might happen now that actually that work was done before covid happened and obviously there's now the london recovery board and there's a recovery task force that is sort of incorporating some of these things and um, is part of the uh, response the mayor's response to covid has been to ratchet up um, his approach in terms of green skills um, to assist with that transition and the skills for londoners framework um, needs to be amended to include that in a much stronger way. We also wanted the mayor to produce an action plan to show his commitment to helping London to make this very firm transition to the low carbon economy, including some details on how he's going to explore um, employment and workforce skills challenges. And we wanted him to provide an avenue both for businesses, but also for unions to communicate very strongly around what their skills needs were, as well as listening to um, some experts uh, around uh, environmental sustainability. Obviously, we also we listened to uh, the Greener Jobs Alliance and the TUC. And the mayor's response was to say that his economic development strategy and London's local industrial st strategy would be prioritising low carbon transition. And again, this is something that has been ratcheted up through the COVID recovery work. Helping Londoners into good work is one of the missions um, in terms of COVID recovery. And it's absolutely critical because if you look at where people have been positioned, the kind of people who've had the worst impacts from COVID, um, then you know they are the people who really deserve and need to be assisted in transitioning into new kinds of work that will give them valuable employment. The mayor's share of the adult education budget is worth 318 million pounds for the 21-22 year that we're in um, and he has prioritized it using some of it for education and training to London is most at risk of use, losing their jobs but we think it's really really important that he does devote at least 10% of the funding towards the green recovery and those kind of new skilled jobs. Um, he has been putting money um, from his own budgets into uh, Green New Deal funding for the Better Futures and Advanced London projects, which um, you may be familiar with. And those are to support the growth of London-based SMEs who mm -hmm. are um, producing new technologies and goods and services to reduce negative impacts on the environment. Um, and he also secured £730,000 through a joint bid with the Retrofit Academy to develop the first part of an NVQ on insulation. As we've been um, addressing uh, air quality issues in London and reducing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from um, motorised transport, the percentage of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from domestic dwellings and appliances has come up as a percentage. And so finally, in his manifesto for this year, the mayor has committed to um, a Green Skills Academy, um, which is going to support um, diverse, sustainable, meaningful and well-paid green jobs. That is uh, going to build on the work of his uh, London Green Spaces Commission, um, which is mainly obviously related to green spaces in London. And he is um, using his funds to try and lever in money from elsewhere. And so has been talking to the Green Finance Initiative and talking to people in the city to try and lever some money in from the um, City of London. We've got three years to um, you know, activate all of the things that I've just mentioned. But in the lead up to COP, there is uh, COP26. I think it is a real opportunity for a real focus on this. Which trade unions are um, involved in the planning and discussion about the uh, the MERS plans which you're talking about? 
we brought in um, Sam Gurney from the TUC um, and we also brought in Graham Peterson from the Greener Jobs Alliance. I was wondering when you were talking about circular economy, something we really would all like to see and we absolutely desperately need. What kind of um, skills, uh, what, have, what have you been looking at in that area, you know, kind of to do with recycling, mm. re, re, reuse, um, reduce our rent, um, repair, uh, etc., which which should be far more mainstream than it is, and there's a big scope for education as well and community involvement. We looked at free cycle. We looked at people who recover metals and make jewellery and other sorts of things. Um, we also spoke to Olio, who um, do uh, at stuff around uh, recycling food. So it, it goes from um, very very instant consumables through to uh, uh, things that you can reclaim and then completely repurpose. The boroughs are responsible for um, the collection of waste, but the mayor has responsibility for the disposal of waste. So unless you get all of the boroughs on board for um, doing segregated uh, collections so that they separate out food waste and they also separate out the six dry recyclates, um, which would include some of the things that you can then recover very easily. And that, of course, then reduces the amount that goes towards incineration or landfill because you are doing that separation. So but that's the responsibility of the, the boroughs who work in these um, groupings. You've got the, um, the, the North London Waste Authority, the East London Waste Authority, Western Riverside Waste Authority, which is what my, what my borough is involved in, and then the Western um, uh, Waste Authority as well. So it's... Um, you know, it, it's actually more complicated than you might think. The mayor has been asking all of the boroughs to produce RRPs, reduction and recycling plans. And when they've been entering into the discussion with the boroughs about those, they have been asking the boroughs to give indications about the reduction element, which is the area that you're talking about that, and how they're going to achieve that. I'm going to have to dash off. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. I think what we'll do is, um, if people are still happy to ask questions, um, and we will record that. It's really good to hear about Sadiq's um, commitments on green issues, but I'm not sure how it fits with going ahead with the Silvertown Tunnel, which just seems to um, be driving a coach and horses through any, um, a coach and horse through any, any sort of, um, targets on on you know uh, restricting global warming and, and climate change in London. She said that the mayor is responsible for disposal of waste so I wondered has the mayor got any powers to place limits on the amount of recyclable content in residual waste that is incinerated. I wanted to touch base on um, whether the um, whether we've reflected on youth and climate curriculum on how to like upskill and raise awareness around climate curriculum with schools and maybe looking at a climate justice angle. I'm particularly interested in community-based heat pumps because it worries me about what we're going to replace um, boilers with. I know they witter on about hydrogen but it strikes me that's a similar thing as the electric car issue so the thought of having a community one would be wonderful. Black Lives Matter and the Edmonton incinerator. Why is Black Lives Matter involved? What we do over here affects people in the continent. And many of our black countries, you know, countries in Africa, the Caribbean, are suffering now because of what's happening here. So the Edmonton incinerator, for those of you who don't know, it's run by the North London Waste Authority. And that is made up of two delegates, two councillor delegates from seven councils. So there is, just in case you live in any of these boroughs, you can start lobbying your councillors. So there is Enfield, Camden, Walthall Forest, Islington, Hackney, Haringey and Barnet. And the, the common theme with most of those councils is six out of seven are Labour councils. Now, loads of MPs have spoken out against this, the expansion of this incinerator. What happened is it came to the end of its life shelf and instead of getting rid of it, they've decided to increase its capacity by 30%. It burns the black and yellow bin rubbish from all of those seven boroughs. 
Now you can imagine the traffic going to the incinerator itself. It's nonstop. It's nonstop lorries going in and out using the North Circular to come back and forth from the incinerator. And um, just like Jane has just said, some of the nonsense responses that we get when we write to these authorities is that it's part of some kind of green strategy. Well, you don't have to be a scientist to, to know that the burning of black and orange bins is not safe. And if you think about what goes into black bins, it's all and sundry, it's batteries, it's electrical you know, equipment, you know, it's all kind of things that are just being built. And the percentage of recyclable waste that is burned is something nearing 60%. So we've got a huge problem on our hands. And I think one of the problems is, is that they've borrowed so much money, um, they're in hot to the bank. And I think they think that they're so far down a rabbit hole that they can't stop. But the issues we have with this incinerator, the issues are life, actually. And that's not just my word. 70 medical doctors wrote to the government with their research and said expanding the incinerators are going to result in a loss of life. And we look at Ella Kissy Deborah and the ruling that we had last year that said her death was in part due to air pollution. Incinerators are three times more likely to exist in areas that have great deprivation. That's, that's fact. And Greenpeace have done lots of research about this. And in inner city areas that have great deprivation, they are likely to have black, brown, and communities from other racial or ethnic groups. And that is the reality. And that is why we say there is environmental racism to where these incinerators are allowed to exist. And if that continues to be ignored by the authorities, then I think we can rightly call that now an institutional issue. That is just not right. That is institutional racism. And we should not kind of hold back on that kind of um, calling it what it is. Now, the issues with the incinerator, particulate matter, the fine particles that come out of these incinerators can travel for many, many miles. It's air pollution. Scientists have linked air pollution to COVID. If you look at an area like Edmonton, they are 40% above the national average for contracting and dying from COVID. And, you know, I absolutely fundamentally believe that there is a link between the air pollution that comes out of those incinerators and what is happening with people's health. This is already a place that has lots of um, air pollution because of the North Circular, and it's overpopulated as a lot of inner city poor areas are. Now, when they tried to build an incinerator in Cambridgeshire, which is a very white middle-class, upper middle-class, upper-class area, they quickly batted that away because it wasn't in keeping with their area. So it's not okay for Cambridge there. Why is it okay for Edmonton? John Crudders, who has the same issue in his area, says that this will send, there's, a, there's the intent to expand an incinerator in his area. And he says this would send more toxic air across the south of his uh, community. And working class communities are the ones that are hit the worst. And it's the truth. It's factual. There's, there's lots of um, evidence to back that up. Why are we the ones that always have to suffer the worst? Um, Dr. Alan Whitehead, the MP, said the age of incineration is over. And he also went on to say, and that is Labour Party policy. And yet six out of seven of these councils that are in charge of the incinerator are forcing it ahead. So what we've done locally is we teamed up Black Lives Matter. We teamed up with a lot of the local XR groups, um, Waltham Forest, Islington, Haringey, Enfield, of course. Um, we wanted to do a different type of campaign that involved to get the community engaged in actually what was going on. And so we developed a leaflet and we've also got some posters. This is our poster. If you want one of our posters, let me know. 
and I can get some sense to you. I'd like them all over London, actually, in people's windows. And we did a campaign and we leafleted um, just about all of Edmonton now and we're moving on to Chingford. In terms of the consultation, the so-called consultation that the NLWA did, um, they say it was open to 2 million residents of North London, 2 million residents of North London. In the first stage of the consultation, only 73 people responded out of 2 million. And in the second stage of the consultation, there was 123 responses. Well, you know, I'm a woman of integrity. If I was supposed to be consulting 2 million people and 100, only 123 people responded, I would say this consultation isn't working. We've got to go back to the drone board. And they pressed ahead. In our campaign, we also have a petition that's attached to it. And we've got 2,000 signatures, 2,000 signatures. So when we made our, our deputation speeches to the NLWA, one of the things that I did say to them was that our petition is up to date and it has more legitimacy than your sham out of date consultation. Most people don't believe it's safe and the people of Edmonton don't want it there. And I'm sure that the neighboring boroughs, if they knew everything about what was happening with the incinerator, and the local neighbourhood, I'm sure they wouldn't support it either. And it's our job to get that message out there. So we want more trade union support for our grassroots campaign because it really has been effective. It's been so effective that Sadiq Khan has now agreed to meet with us. So we have a date for a meeting in September um, and he has come out against incineration and Joanne McCartney, one of his deputies, have now said she's completely against incineration and the council needs to consider. But those are just words. You know, I don't see any campaigning or any strong action coming from its office and that's what needs to happen. So um, please come and help us get involved. Uh, I've got a stop the Edmonton incinerator at gmail.com. Our community has the right to breathe clean air. It's great to hear from Delia actually because there's so many parallels between our campaign and hers. The tunnel was actually um, the brainchild of Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London. And uh, prior to be, um, being elected, Siddiqui Khan said he would, you know, look at this very carefully. He, he wasn't very positive about the tunnel, but after the election, it didn't really have a proper review in my opinion. And in 2019, the tunnel was signed off. Now, there were, there were lots of problems with the Silvertown Tunnel. And we've had um, dozens of trade union, Labour Party branches and CLPs supporting our motion, calling for the cancellation of the tunnel. And that motion will come up at um, London Labour Conference this weekend. So why are we so against the Silvertown Tunnel? The Silvertown Tunnel is going to be built between the Greenwich Peninsula and um, East London, i.e. it will, it will um, exit or the, en the entrance, whichever way you look at it, will be in Silvertown, hence the name. On the peninsula already, we have a tunnel. Those of you will be very familiar with the tunnel, um, many of you, um, the Blackhall Tunnel. Um, the Blackhall Tunnel is two lanes each way. The Silvertown Tunnel will be four lanes each way. In addition to being four lanes each way, it also has a dedicated HGV lane. We are encouraging heavy goods rear goods to go through the Greenwich Peninsula Lane to Newham. Newham is UK's most heavily polluted borough. It is also one of the most deprived boroughs in the country. And it's also, if not the most, one of the most ethnically diverse boroughs in the country. HGVs are enormously polluting. Not only are they diesel engines, which creates a lot of emissions. But actually, and this is what most people aren't aware of, majority of air pollution actually comes from a particular matter, which Delia spoke about earlier. Because a particular matter that comes from vehicles comes from the, the tires, and it comes from the brakes, and it comes from the road attrition. So this gets even worse when you've got heavy goods vehicles coming down. Tires, um, and road attrition and brake attrition actually produce almost a thousand times more particular matter uh, um, or more air pollution than uh, vehicle emissions because vehicles are now cleaner.
And why this is so important, because people talk about electric cars and all, all our problems are going to be solved by electric cars. Well, that in itself is a fallacy because electric cars are heavier than normal vehicles and therefore will create more particular matter than petrol or diesel engine cars. It's also a fallacy in terms of climate change, because if you want to um, power electric cars, you have to charge them and they have to be charged through power stations. Now, even the most optimistic scientists will tell you that um, if we convert all our cars by, to electric by 2050, we will have to double power generation on the natural, national grid. And most optimistic projections say we'd only be able to meet 50% of that increased demand through new renewables. So the questions are, if we're going to carry on with our car usage like we are and just convert them to electricity, where is all that ele extra electricity generation going to come from? It's either going to come from burning more fossil fuels or it's going to come from nuclear energy. So you choose which one you want because that's the only solution. So the argument is if we build another tunnel, we will have less, less traffic. Well, there's many ways where this is incorrect. Well, firstly, as all road projects have demonstrated, and I give you a perfect example, the Dartford Bridge. The Dartford Bridge was built for very similar reasons why the Silvertown Tunnel is going to be built to alleviate traffic off the Dartford Tunnel. And what has happened? Both those crossings are now in gridlock. Because what happens is when you build road, more road capacity, i.e. when people see empty roads, that encourages them to drive more. It encourages more traffic. And TfL's own figures say, building the Silvertown Tunnel will attract more vehicles. The way they intend to keep a cap on traffic is not through the tunnel, is by actually tolling both tunnels. Even if um, carbon pricing, any kind of carbon pricing was to work, it has to be so high, it has to be so high that it'd be too regressive for ordinary people. But let's argue, let's, let's take for argument's sake, it does work, which it doesn't work because it doesn't work on Dartford crosses, but let's say for argument's sake, it does work. If it does work, then why are we building the tunnel? If it does work, why don't we toll the Blackpool Tunnel and reduce the traffic that way? Why haven't we tried tolling the Blackpool Tunnel to reduce the traffic first before we spend two billion pounds on a PFI contract um, to, see, to see if that works first? Secondly, there's another argument saying, well, the Blackpool Tunnel is out of date and it closes frequently and it's not fit for purpose and we need a new modern tunnel, okay? Well, if that's the case, why are you building a tunnel that is twice the capacity? If that's the case, why aren't you closing the Blackpool Tunnel after you've built the Silvertown Tunnel? If that is the case, why are you sticking HGVs down the Silvertown Tunnel? Because there are no HGVs that can go through the Blackpool Tunnel at the moment. So this is for the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change. The blue line is what the Tyndall Centre says we should be doing for London. And it's saying that we need a 76% reduction in the next decade. So you can, you, you can see this balloon and how steeply it falls in the next 10 years, okay? This, the orange line, is what Greater London Authority trajectory is for emissions, okay? And this is just a trajectory. It doesn't mean they're gonna meet it, it's what they hope to meet. But even on their you know, on the trajectory, they only reach 36% in the next decade. Now, people might say, well, look at the end. They're, they're kind of very similar towards the end, towards 2050, they're very close. Well, it might be too late by 2050. Remember, the important thing is reducing carbon, um, carbon emissions very quickly. But what is really telling and really significant is at the top here is what TfL are doing. And TfL projections, and this is with the T Silvertown Tunnel, is showing hardly any change over the next 20 years. Way behind the targets required to meet the Paris Climate Accords. Now, through the Blackwater Tunnel at present, primary users are from outside London, who would either be commercial vehicles or commuters, likely to be 
not the same demographics of the residents in Newham. So basically what they're doing is bringing their pollution, dumping their pollution by driving through these tunnels into Newham, into the most polluted borough in the country, into one of the most deprived boroughs in the country, and into the one of the country's most diverse boroughs in the country. So in a sense, the project could be argued to be discriminatory, or to use a stronger word, racist. On all levels, this is a disaster. And it's a disaster for, for, for the Labour Party and Sadiq Khan as well, because this is going to be around for decades. And people are going to see this huge construction, and people are going to remember this as a legacy of Sadiq Khan, and they're going to see this as a legacy of the Labour Party, and it's going to be damaging. And when climate disaster is striking the world, and we've got this huge project built in the centre of London, people are going to remember this. And we have to persuade the mayor, because it's not his project. Remember that, it is not his project. It is Boris Johnson's project. So he's got plenty of room for manoeuvre here. So what my appeal is, and it's really important that we persuade our trade union delegates at the Labour Party conference this weekend, and our CLP delegates, if you have any contacts or any relationships with any of the delegates in your CLPs or trade unions, please contact them. This affects all our children's lives. This all affects all our grandchildren's lives. This affects all the pupils that I teach lives and all of our lives and, and the lives of people in developing countries who are gonna be the most tragically affected by climate change. Silvertown Tunnel. Um, fails on um, a value for money um, scale as well. You know, TfL at the moment is in terrible trouble with money because we're completely in hock to the government, like to keep running during um, the pandemic. You know, we had to keep running. We're an essential service. So the argument was made, you must keep running your essential service. You now have no income whatsoever because we have no government funding. All TfL's money comes from advertising, um, renting out properties and obviously fares. We had none of that, but all of the costs. We now find ourselves terribly in debt to the government, who's got us, you know, on a bit of a bit of string, really, with um, as regards funding. Um, so two billion pounds is a lot of money um, that could be used on um, other transport. He now needs to make a billion and a half pounds worth of savings within 18 months. Um, what it's liable to do is start withdrawing cycle lanes and these kinds of things, you know, like projects already ongoing. Those who are in favour of it will argue that, well, actually, it's not going to cost TfL money because it's PFI. It's going to be tolls on the tunnel. But <laughs> the irony is uh, that, well, if you just told, if there's two billion pounds that could be taken for motorists, okay, I, if you, for example, told the Blackpool Tunnel without building the Silvertown Tunnel, okay, and I'm not necessarily saying I'm in favour of tolling the Blackpool Tunnel for various reasons, but let's, for argument's sake, we told the Silvertown Tunnel, surely that money from, I'm no, sorry, the Blackpool Tunnel, surely that money from tolling the Blackpool Tunnel is best used to improve public transport. Um, rather than me going to a private contractor and filling up their pockets with £2 billion. They'll also dispute the £2 billion, pounds because they say it actually only costs just over a billion pounds to make the tunnel. But it's not, we know with PFI contracts, it's not just building the tunnel. It's all the payments for 25 years and all the inflation. And then basically the £2 billion pounds comes from basically the amount of money that's going to come out of motorist pockets over the course of 25 years. As Izzy said, these contributions also relate to what is happening this weekend at Labour Party conference. So there is a motion on TfL funding, which is obviously profoundly affected by the spend on Silvertown Tunnel. There's a motion on Silvertown, there's a motion on the incinerator, and there's a just transition motion too um, for London. Labour CND is a caucus of CND members who um, also members of the Labour Party and we work to promote the aims and objectives of CND within the party. Now, you might be sort of familiar that obviously we're opposing nuclear weapons, but we are also prioritizing a Green New Deal and supporting just transition and promoting the recognition of the need to include the nuclear context in Green New Deal discussions and policy development. Izzy made the reference to nuclear energy and where we're gonna get all this electricity from. Um, this is a really key debate, not because um, it, 
about nuclear power, but nuclear power so closely links to the whole weapons debate as well, because we are actually the, the investments which we're making into nuclear weapons, um, and sorry, our civilian nuclear program is cross-funding the nuclear weapons program. And there's been a lot of research on that. And I think coming back to those questions of environmental racism, um, you know, the, the issue around obviously anybody using such weapons of mass destruction with, would have um, you know, in, incredible impacts um, that we, we wouldn't be able to come back from, not just in terms of the weapons attacks, but also uranium mining. So for example, that impacts Aboriginal lands in Australia. And I think as well, just um, while London may feel a bit far from, you know, the basis holding the UK's so-called nuclear deterrent, it's not far from being obviously under threat. And it was quite interesting last year, um, 75 years since the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, um, some an academic was quoted saying a, a, a nuclear detonation of several hundred kilotons over the centre of London would destroy most of the city and break windows as far away as Croydon and Wolverstow. And I'm sitting in Wolverstow right now. But I think to get on to the, the point and leaking into the, the COP as well, it's, it's about priorities of also where we, you know, aside from the, the moral arguments, but the priorities of actually where we make our investments and Leone had referred to, you know, the need for insulation and retrofit and all the things that we need to do. And the, the reason why we kind of called this a super fund um, discussion is because COP is really an opportunity to super fund a peaceful world. And if we want to tackle climate change, if we want to address all the issues that we need to do in London and elsewhere across the country, then we need to be putting our resources into that and then obviously the the workers and our communities that will be transitioning um, through the decarbonisation of the economy and I think one thing I just wanted to highlight which is probably less well known when we talk about these words a just transition um, which is about the the protections of, of workers um, through the decarbonisation programme. So whilst as a trade union movement, we fought for a long time for the inclusion of that in the climate talks, um, and, and they were included in the Paris Climate Agreement, we, the actual origins of those go back to a trade union leader in the US who worked for the atomic um, chemical um, um, industry in, in the US. And he actually understood very early on in the 1970s and was very interested in linking issues of occupational health and safety and environmental destruction and recognizing that then if corporations were be, being bailed out with super funds to clean up their hazards and their waste, then there should be super funds for workers to do the same. So I think for us really is about, you know, if, if we want to talk about real solidarity and real just transition and tackle all these issues of climate justice um, and taking head on issues of environmental racism, then we, we have to understand the um, impacts of nuclear within these debates as well, as well and ensure that we fight for a transition that's based on justice, peace, and social, what we call socially useful work. Um, and obviously prioritize the funds and the huge amounts that are now being dedicated to you know, increased military spending when those could be going to budgets elsewhere, including you know, to support the, the transitions which we need in London as well. So I think just to sort of wrap up this section, I, I guess it's a plea to you know, try and get this on the agenda of CLPs and have more debate around this and the whole nuclear deterrent question, which Keir Starmer has said is non-negotiable. So in, in terms of the, the COP, I am actually in PCS trade union. I'm not speaking here in PCS capacity, but I do represent, um, along with Unison trade union on the COP coalition, um, civil society groups, um, coordinating committee to try and build the labour movement engagement around the COP climate talks that are obviously taking place in Glasgow in November. We're aiming to mobilise people in Glasgow on the 6th of November, but because of COVID restrictions, which were anticipated quite early on, we will also be holding a simultaneous large demonstration in London on the 6th of November as well. Um, so discussions have just started in bringing together a 
COP26 coalition hub in London. We had the first meeting last week. Next one's going to be on the 31st of July, which will hopefully be um, in an open space, obviously um, COVID safe space as well. But part of the coalition is also, is also about bringing in lots of these local issues too. So whilst obviously it's about global and global demands, and this is all part of the international way in which we have to link in and talking about climate change, obviously, we, we, we do have pertinent issues which have um, been very well talked about here and you know helped mobilize across the labor movement in trade unions or within the Labour Party or other areas to participate in these demonstrations and these discussions. And we're being quite ambitious, aiming to 50 to 100,000 people on the streets of London for the biggest climate demonstrations and hopefully the biggest representation of the labour movement within those demonstrations as well. Going back to the discussions around the Edmonton incinerator, I had reason to look on the North London Heat and Power website, and I was really surprised to see how unambitious um, North London Waste Authority is. The claim is that the new incinerator will allow them to reach a 50% recycling rate across the um, the seven London boroughs. To say that we have to build a bigger incinerator uh, to help us go and reach a, a, a lower recycling rate than um, a number of other Western countries is ridiculous. And I suspect not only will we end up with the pollution caused by the incineration, but we'll also end up with lorries coming from further and further away bringing waste from other councils you know probably up into going up into the midlands to keep this incinerator working at capacity to help pay off the um the bank loan all these things that we've been talking about all these things that relate to climate justice um that relate to the triple pandemics that we're suffering with with covid with climate with racism all these things intersect, um, but there's a very positive thing that we can do, and that's actually to create many more jobs, the community jobs, the trade union jobs, the public sector jobs that we actually need. And there are many more jobs in a circular economy than many more jobs in public transport. And for example, the whole drive towards, oh, it's all got to be electric cars. Uh, we've already talked about uh, a little touched on environmental racism, and Sam um, pointed out that if we're not careful, we're going to do that thing that we're so good at in, in Britain, and that's um, neo, that's going to be another colonial aspect to it, because we're looking only at how we are, not globally. So, you know, the amount of lithium, the amount of um, mining that's needed for those batteries, they, um, there was already a coup in Bolivia, wasn't there, at, at one point, you know, um, it's kind of like, we, we can't just do what we have been doing and doing it a little bit differently with technology. And the very worrying thing about COP and the whole drive, it's all about techno fixes, it's all about technology. Mm -hmm. And um, there are unproven technologies for a start, um, but the ones that we know will would work in that you, you can build electric cars, but we can't have just replace everything as Izzy was saying with millions of electric cars. Um, and um, in the trade union movement, uh, we, there's, there's gradually more people waking up to the fact that in a circular economy you can have more jobs. These, some of these are very capital heavy projects. So the, the incinerator is a huge capital build, but there could be so many more jobs um, in reusing, recycling, um, it, working with the community on recycling, repairing, um, you know, and sort of, you know, and, and just not producing and producing in this sort of linear economy the whole time. So I think we have got some great opportunities and I think we should talk more, get together in the future to look um, at how we can detail just transition or worker led just transition and how we work across the piece.